Hey there! We just wanted to take a moment to thank each and every one of you who have listened, shared, engaged, and sent us love. It means the world to know that we've had the chance to spread even just a little bit of knowledge, insight, and encouragement to you along your health journeys. If you'd like to support the work we're doing, we've created a Patreon page where you can earn some exciting rewards, because being a part of the HIP team isn't just a hobby, it's a lifestyle. Contributions start as low as $1 a month, with each level offering a number of super fun perks, like monthly bonus episodes, Q&As, a portrait drawn by our own in-house artists, and even personal chats with the Health It's Personal team. We created this podcast so that everyone can have the chance to access informative, inspirational, and insightful stories. And your support is a huge step in us reaching those who need it most. We wish we could give you all a big hug, but hopefully this will suffice, at least until we're allowed to hug again. If you love what you hear or are as passionate about health as we are, please visit patreon.com slash the hip podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash the HIP podcast. We couldn't do this without you. So thank you again. And thanks in advance for joining our ever growing hip family. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Health It's Personal, where we try to fight stigma, raise awareness, and have conversations about all matters of health. Last week, we talked to psychiatric nurse and mental health coach Sarah Baxter, where she shared insight into young adults and psychosis. Well, this week, we have more from Sarah. You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) She was so insightful that it's just great to hear so much more from her because she has so much knowledge to share. Yeah, we could do a whole series with Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, she rocks. Her passion is so evident, and I couldn't imagine a better person to speak with about such a heavy topic as suicide. She's extremely positive, hopeful, and encourages us all to be kind and open when talking to the people that we love. Yeah, that's it. That's really important. So good. Yeah, it's something that nobody really truly wants to talk about, and it's not something we often talk about, whether it's with our families, with our friends, even on the internet. Um, even with, you know, strangers on Twitter or Reddit or whatever it might be. Um, it's something that we need to talk more about because it is important. And like she said, talking about it doesn't make it more prevalent. It actually helps. It helps people feel that they're not alone, that people care about them, that we're all here in this together and that they are, you know, we want them to be here with us. Mm-hmm. That they belong. Yeah. Yeah, we always talk about how giving how you're feeling a name can help you gain control over it, like anxiety, for example. And I think talking about suicide in terms of it being a thought process that many people have and talking about it calmly will kind of take the stigma away from it and make it more simpler and therefore easier to control and kind of see past. Absolutely. It it does. It does. It really helps. Uh, you know, it's is something that is depicted in, you know, when we usually learn about it, it might be on a TV show or a movie or in a book uh, or on the news, right? We'll hear certain details or we'll see certain perspectives, but it's something that can be so massive or even personal that it comes in many shapes and sizes. So I think it's important to just be aware of it and to have that visibility of what people are going through. As a parent, um, something that I find kind of what you were to what you're saying, Sean, is that if I don't find the space or the time or the bravery to talk about topics that are scary or confusing or like if I don't understand something enough to talk about it with my kids, then they're going to get that information somewhere else. Yeah. And it might be on a television show and it might be in a movie and that wasn't meant for education. You know what I mean? So if that if that experience is um, the only experience that they have or the thing that they see or that person has a certain feeling or idea about it, then that's all they get unless I unless I take the time to show them something different or talk about something different. Yeah. And uh, kind of on, on that note, if I, if I may uh, get a little nerdy and you wax may. poetic, even <laughs> um, there is a show called Battlestar Galactica, which they re remade um, er- in the early two thousands. And like you said, sometimes we'll see things in media that might not be an accurate portrayal or it might not be intended to educate. And it was the only time I've really seen something that I feel accurately portrayed suicide and it was kind of what we talked about today uh, regarding hope and it's kind of this this plot of where it's humans living on 12 planets that are all destroyed and they 
are just the few survivors left and they're trying to reach Earth. And we go through three years of this journey of trying to get to Earth and they reach Earth or so they think. And there's this character who I really cared for and, you know, they get to this place they've kept on, they've held this hope all these years and they finally get there and they realize it's not exactly what they were looking for. And instead of pushing through, she decides that she can't handle that anymore. She can't keep going. And it was such a devastating moment, but I feel like it was so powerful. It's too powerful, in fact, that I couldn't watch it again. <laughs> um, but it you kind of understood what she was thinking and feeling in that moment, and it was really difficult. But I've also seen portrayals in media that were not accurate. And I've had, um, you know, talking today with Sarah helped me realize I know so many people who have had these experiences um, more than I actively remember. And it's it's so important and it touches our lives in such a deep way that it's important to discuss these things in an accurate and safe way. Yeah. And there's a chance that something that you say might make a difference in a person who is having feelings about something that you didn't even know. She explained to us that we have this idea that somebody who's suicidal is sad or depressed or you would know, and that's not always the case. So these open dialogues can really make a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes a tragedy has to happen before we have these discussions. There have been a few tragedies at my son's school And that brings up those conversations, which I'm so thankful for, but I need to be having those conversations, making sure that they're often so they become more comfortable. It's so important that the people who are struggling see that there's hope. And, you know, Sarah mentions how you can bring up, oh, where do you want to go on vacation next summer? Or, but sometimes you need hope in a shorter time frame. So where, where would you like to go to dinner this weekend? Or, oh, we're going to go fishing tomorrow or, you know, this or that and bringing We're going to watch Gilmore Girls later. <laughs> yeah, we're going to watch Gilmore Girls later. <laughs> yeah, reminding them that there are things to be hopeful for. Yeah, and excited about and just engaging each other. Yeah, even if we don't have maybe our family doesn't have the means to go on a vacation or to plan one, right? But we can still try our best to find ways to, like you said, we, it comes in so many shapes and sizes. Hope can be so many things for so many people. We just have to find that hope and find ways to share that hope with others and hope that we, our influence on them is going to help them through what they're going through. Life can get so busy and you can come home from work, you know, forget to kiss and hug your spouse when they walk in the door, move on to the next thing, you know, get the rest of your day turned around and the days get away from you. And I think now, especially, we're all looking to the future, trying to remember that what's the hope at the end of this? What do I get to do when I get to go outside again? Just uh, taking a moment for a family meal, cooking together or doing an activity that you all enjoy that's free or just, you know, it's about more the engagement than the physical activity. Also, I think it was really important that different people feel more comfortable in conversations at different times in different places. So um, Henry talked about car therapy. She talked about talking in a car. I talk with Max in a car. You were saying, Sean, that you feel more comfortable when you're not looking directly at someone. So a car would be a great place for that. Yeah. (laughs) Scott talks to Max a lot when they go camping so much so that I think Max is going to be like, I'm done camping with you, dude. But um, <laughs> but when Wait you're sitting minute. around a campfire, yeah, <laughs> want to go camping? I do not. <laughs> it's like taking the pet to the vet, and you're like, "We're yeah. gonna go for a ride," and they're yeah, like, yeah, "Hey, exactly. wait a minute." <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't have to be a big sit down. Like we're talking about suicide, or this thing happened, or do you have these thoughts? Well, and when you don't talk it about it very often, then it becomes this once a year deep discussion. And it's hard to relate such a big topic to your life if you're not experiencing those thoughts right now, especially as a teenager. You're like, well, how does this even relate to me? I understand what you're saying, but like, this is too broad. There's too much. This is too serious. Like my life is about my friends and blah, blah, blah. If you bring it up when, you know, on different occasions and you you kind of talk about it in a really calm and human way instead of it just being a headline, 
uh, that could be more effective. I agree. It's it's much more than a headline or statistic. Or... But it's it's a really serious topic, and I hope that just this small discussion with Sarah helps somebody find a way to talk with a young person about feelings um, so that they know that when they are feeling that way, they can come to you. Hopefully this conversation will give you some encouragement or some inspiration or just help you feel like you're validated. So please grab a cup of tea and enjoy. Health is understanding what you need. Being informed. Finding that balance of mental and physical. Building yourself a support system. Figuring things out on my own and not letting it hold me back. You do kind of have to advocate for yourself. Because health, it's personal. Would you mind explaining the connection between mental health and suicide? You talked a bit about it with psychosis and how parents might be able to have real conversations with their kids about suicide. Yeah, yeah, really important. So suicide and mental health, I mean, just go go hand in hand for sure. And I mean, depression, depression is awful because it affects your mood and it makes you feel like you're in this black hole and there's no way out. Anxiety is awful because it just feels so uncomfortable and those panic attacks and you think you just want to end them. And sometimes for some people, it's not even about the the, the suicide, the, the dying. It's just about stopping how bad they're feeling right now. For a lot of people who I've spoken to who have attempted suicide, um, they say they just want the pain to stop. They just want to stop feeling this way. And they don't necessarily want to die. And I think that's a really important thing when you're having those conversations to differentiate between you know, what is it that suicide will bring you? What are they wanting? Because it's really different if someone you know just wants that anxiety to stop or that depression to stop or that feeling they have, the pain. Um, other voices, um, everybody has different experiences. So that's one thing to think about. In terms of psychosis, when people are acutely psychotic they tend to be lower risk but they are still a risk because they might believe that they've got superpowers and can fly um, or they might believe that they're god and nobody can harm them and so they're going to approach people um you know or, or do things you know they can become quite disinhibited so they might um, get aggressive and you know be at risk of approaching the wrong person at the wrong time Mm. or jumping in front of a car or I had one gentleman who watched Inception Mm. and it really just triggered something for his brain and he thought that he was living in this kind of different level of the universe and so he crashed his car into a central reservation because he thought it would take him to a different level oh my goodness yeah yeah psychosis you know can be it's it's interesting but then as they start to get better that's when they're the higher risk like we spoke about because they're starting to then um, gain more insight and they realize they don't have these special powers they don't have um, these amazing things they they've had you know they've got a mental health issue so suicide and model there's lots of different models out there but the model that I really like and use is one called um, by Thomas Joyner um, who sadly passed away last year um, but his model is is incredible and what it does is it incorporates different models into one and so you have these three elements of, of all you know humans all have them and you have something called um perceived burdensomeness and that's the first element and that's if people feel like they're a burden and it's perceived it's not actual because i, I work with people who've had who have children and you think well, that's a reason to live but for them no that's a, they're a burden to their children and their children would be better off without them and they believe mm. that oh or they feel like they're a burden to society and they're not bring anything to society. So these are things that parents can look out for in their children when they're um, thinking about suicidality. It's, does that person, you know, are they saying odd little comments that make it seem that they're they're perceiving themselves to be a burden? Like, if they're not seeing their friends because they're saying, oh no, they, I'll only bring them down or they'll have more fun without me or Mm -hmm. you will have more fun without me um, and those kind of things to think about and so that's kind of the one element of it the second element is called um thwarted belongingness so people feel like they just don't belong anywhere they feel very alone and that's a huge huge thing for people if they if they feel like it is what they don't belong at work they don't fit in they don't fit their group of friends or they don't 
know where to go to, you know, they don't have a course or a, a group or an extracurricular activity or they, they don't in with the family. It's a sense of belongingness. And, and what I would do in my job is always, always emphasize that they are part of my team. They are with EIP, they are with me. And sometimes that can be a little bit of a saving grace for them it's just finding ways to make them feel that they belong and even if it's just your my daughter you're my son you belong in this family making them feel that they belong is really really helpful and then the third aspect is acquired capability mm. so some people have access to means and if you're in a family where there's guns and you know your your child knows about shooting and, and has access to guns um and maybe has been around guns and um seen animals being shot or they've, they've shot the gun like that's an acquired capability mm. Or maybe they've made an attempt before on their life, you know, the myth, I think, or a misconception that if someone made an attempt, they weren't serious, so they're fine, they're safe, but actually they're more right. risky mm -hmm. than the red flag for me as a mental health professional because they're then developing that tolerance to it. So maybe next time they'll take some more tablets, maybe next time they'll um, cut a bit deeper, or maybe you know, next time they'll tie the rope a bit tighter, whatever it might be. Um, mm. So if they've made an attempt before, or they're spending a lot of time watching films about death mm -hmm. or um, reading literature about death. They're becoming a bit preoccupied with, with the idea of, of death. That can be a warning sign as well, because what they're doing is they're building up a tolerance to it, to pain or to death. And the one thing that can keep people alive is fear of death and fear of pain. Some people you know, say, I want to die, but I'm just a coward and I'm too scared. Mm -hmm. And that's great because that's something that keeps them safe. That's their kind yeah. of protective because they're slowly starting to get closer to that edge at the train station um, or a bit further over that bridge or whatever it might be, they're developing that acquired capability. And people on farms are interestingly more likely to commit suicide because they've got access to means, doctors, soldiers. Mm. You know, those kind of people are, are higher risk. Because they have those thoughts and feelings, but they also have they're desensitized in certain ways or have certain means to actually act on it. Yeah. 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 So nurses and doctors know what to do. They know they know the body. They've got access to the drugs that are there to the equipment and the same as farmers, they've got access to the equipment. And um, and so what, what Thomas Donner's theory is, is that you need the acquired capability, the perceived burdensomeness and the thought of belongingness. And if that person has all three of those elements, they are right in the center and they are significant risk of suicide. Yeah, I, I wrote an article once a couple of years ago when I lived in Australia about farmer suicide rates, because uh, not only are you so reliant on what you're doing and your livelihood and your whole life is your farm. So in Australia, they've had a drought for many, many years. So then all of a sudden, you know, they're losing their livelihood, but they also have this isolation. So they don't have anyone to talk to outside of their family. And there are groups who go out to rural towns and uh, conduct group therapy and get people to open up about it a bit more, which is really nice. Amazing. And that's bringing them some kind of belongingness. They feel like they belong to some. Yeah. And also for some, you know, some people that if they are farmers and they're working and they, you know, start to become depressed and struggle with their mood, they're going to feel like, well, you know, my family while they're working and I'm, I just, I haven't got the energy. I just literally cannot get out of bed. I feel awful. Um, and that's going to impact as well because then they feel like they're letting the family down and they're the burden and like a guilt perpetuating. Yeah. Uh, so what I would say to, to parents or to anybody is one most important thing. And again, it's a common misconception. People think talking about suicide and asking someone about suicide is going to make them suicidal. It does not. Or give them an idea. Yeah, parents do think that. Or if it happens at a school and another child, they're afraid to bring it up like it's contagious or something. Yeah. And it, it from my experience, and I've worked a lot around suicide it's the exact opposite and um, there's a really interesting statistic that when i go and see somebody who's um, tried to take their own life i was feeling very suicidal and unsafe if i don't bring it up in the first three minutes that person is unlikely to then tell me about it when i ask them 
it can feel really uncomfortable. And sometimes people say they don't want to talk about it because they don't even know what they would say if that person said they were feeling suicidal. And people are just scared. But talking about it does not give somebody the idea or make them any more likely to feel suicidal. If you speak to anybody who's ever felt that way, they'll say it's almost like a relief because they don't feel so alone in it, um, which helps with that belongingness. Absolutely. So having those, if you think about those three elements, and especially the belongingness and the burdensomeness, having conversations around that so that you can, even if it's just small things like trying to reinforce that you're really valued and you're really important and doing things to make them feel that way is, is really helpful because that's going to take one of those three elements away. Another thing that I think is really important in suicide for me is people can lose quite a lot. I work with people who have lost their job and their family and finances and their friends and you know really everything and you would think they'd be suicidal but they aren't and when I speak to them more about it they all have hope and that's really important I think that one can have a beautiful life but if they don't have hope they're a big risk for me right yeah so what does hope look like yeah well I mean I guess it's it's person to that individual, whether it's hope that they can get better, hope things won't always feel this way, um, hope for their future, hope that tomorrow could be better, you know, whatever it is. So sometimes having a conversation with your loved one or child just about, um, you know, their, their hopes and their dreams, um, you know, about a holiday they might want to go on or a restaurant, you know, if you can't go that far in advance because they're just really that unwell, um, a restaurant they might want to go to this weekend, it, it's something you're trying to look at their hope because that's another, for me, little element. And if people have got those three, then I'm going to look at hope. And if they don't have hope, then I'm, I'm probably going to be putting some plans in place because they are very high risk to me. Mm. I love that so much because it's really something that parents can kind of grab onto, like two tangible things that I know that I can do on a daily basis to make sure that my teenager, young adult feels part of our family, like they know they belong, and also giving somebody something to look forward to or talking about dreams and hopes. Those are things that I can really do, and I love that because... The rest of it, I think, is kind of below the surface, but those are really tangible things that I can do to make sure that my son or daughter feels like they belong and that they have something to look forward to. Yeah. You've said, like, it's important to talk about, and I've had a conversation, but mostly, like, if something happens, which is terrible, but a good friend of Max's, his childhood friend committed suicide, and I knew that Max's good friend was really suffering, and so that gave me an opportunity to talk to Max. Luckily, those instances are few and far between, but that means that we're not having a dialogue about that on a regular basis. How would you suggest bringing up or talking with someone? Yeah, I think it's different for different individuals. And you might even find that the conversation with one of your children will go differently to the conversation with the other because they're different and they need different approaches. Um, so you you guys, like you, you'll know your child or your family best. But I mean, there's always things in the media. If, you, if you're starting to worry and you think, oh my gosh, I'm just, just there's a niggling feeling here. You can, you know, it's not very nice. But you can sometimes kind of lie and say, oh, I was reading this story in the media um, about suicide statistics or about statistics about, you know, adolescents and how hard it is for them and how they don't feel they've got someone to speak to. And I just wanted to, I know you know, but wanted to reiterate that I'm always here and that I love you and you're a valued part of the family. I would be devastated without you, like things like that. So, Right. I heard an episode of this podcast and... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you can kind of, you're not saying I'm worried about you. Oh, for some right. people, you would be able to say, I've noticed you're keeping to yourself a bit, or I've noticed that you're doing this. I've noticed you're not yourself recently. Um, you're not your usual self, and are you okay? And if it's a year, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, good, but please know I am here. And also maybe saying, and if you don't feel you can talk to me, who could you talk to? Who else could you talk to? And think and giving them space to think about who else they've got to speak to and some of them might be able to identify a godparent or an uncle or a friend um, but if they can't then again saying 
you know, if you don't feel you can talk to me or you don't have anybody else to speak to, then know that there's there's forums, there's other people that are online and signposting them to other websites. And because there's, there's websites, suicide in men is much, much higher than it is in women. I think women attempt it more, but males are more kind of um, able to complete it because their methods are usually more extreme. So especially if you've got an adolescent boy, there's so much. There's papyrus, there's calm, is it? Campaign against living miserably. Yes, yeah, so, so just maybe reminding them that there's those things there. As if they don't feel they can speak to you, who else could they speak to? And if there's literally nobody, there's there's other people out there feeling this way too. Because again, that's going to help them feel like they belong. They're not alone. Mm-hmm. My sister-in-law teaches second grade, and they had a tragedy at their school. And afterwards, she had all of her students make a list on paper of all the people that care for them so that they knew they had a list of people that they could talk to. And I think a lot of them were surprised at how big their list was. And I remember kind of making Max go down that list too, because I wanted him to remember that besides me, your mom who drives you completely crazy, (laughs) there are many, many other people who care about your well-being. Yeah. And then if they are feeling able to have a conversation with you, then there's a free training and you can either do a 10 minute one or there's a more like intense 20 minute one. If you kind of Google zero suicide alliance, they do training and it just helps kind of lay people understand how to have those conversations, you know, what just what to say to somebody. But for me, if somebody says I'm feeling really suicidal today, kind of don't panic just because they're feeling it, you know, it doesn't mean they're going to do it. And and it's just like, thank you so much for telling me. Like that's the first thing. Thank you for telling me and really well done for telling me because that can't have been easy. And then let's let's that is this a new thing is it just started has it been a few weeks or a few months we've felt like this before and then thinking about have they got a plan so you know are you thinking about it or have you been researching it or have you you know started to get the material you might need for it and then again you're looking at that acquired capability at that point yeah um and maybe what do you you know does it does it scare you to think about it and what does it mean to to take your own life you know what is it that doing that will provide you? So you're literally like, I think of myself as a detective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, in, and that person will feel so relieved, so relieved to have spoken. And that in itself can literally save someone. How, what's the appropriate yes. way to react? You know, how do you, how do you navigate that? It's challenging. Everybody's different. So I will react differently to one person to I will another. But just that, I mean, you can't really go wrong except to dismiss it. And right. Don't, and not seriously and say oh life is bad for us all right now get on with it that's the worst thing you can do so long as you're acknowledging it in some way and getting them to talk about it um, and not panicking and not getting angry you know because as a parent that must be so difficult to hear your child say that they're thinking that life would be better off if they were dead that's difficult and so you think no 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 and you can get angry um but that's not going to help them speak to you about it that's going to make them shut off yeah, it's a hard, it's good to remember that that moment isn't about you. It would be easy to make it about you because that's your child and a person that you love. And now you're having this moment, which is a tragic moment for a parent, right? But in that moment, it's about the, that person. Yeah, it's not about you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say, um, on a related note, um, um, you know, we want to support, obviously, the parents want to support their children. What if the roles were reversed in that situation and you had a parent who was going through these these thoughts and feelings and you as the child would like to help the parent and hopefully that kind of makes sense. I know it's something, yeah. I think that's something that fewer people talk about, you know, as few as people talk about <laughs> suicide in general, you know. Yeah, or a friend. Yeah, yeah. And that must be so, so hard because if a, parent's, if a parent is suicidal, they're probably um, very closed off they're despondent they're kind of they're not with you and that can be so difficult for that child because they feel like dad or mum doesn't love me i mean it's really difficult and it's easy for me to say what i'm going to say because i don't have to live in that situation but i think in that, in that position looking after yourself is so so important because you can beg that parent to go and get some help but if they're not ready to they're just not ready to and this there's such a high risk that someone like me can come and um have them placed in hospital against their wishes 
nothing. They, they, they don't have to take medication. They don't have to talk to anybody. And that's a really difficult thing for people to accept. And as a child, that's really difficult because you want them to get help. Right. I was going to say, and you're used to maybe the role of where you, you need to be taken care of by the parent, but what happens when? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think understanding that that individual is their own person and you're not responsible for them. They've got their own brain, they've got their own decisions, and you can do things to help them for sure. Just talking about those three aspects, you know, you can tell them that you love them and that they're your mum or your dad or your friend and that you, you know, you couldn't be without them and those kind of things. Like life without them would, would just not exist. You couldn't live without them. Right. Um, because that helps them feel like they're not a burden. But ultimately, if they're just not in a space they're ready to, they could maybe reach out to somebody else that they trust, like an adult. Okay. Encourage them to maybe speak to somebody they think might be helpful in speaking to them or just they don't feel so alone in it. So if they can see that behavior, but nobody else can, that could be helpful so that then there's an adult involved if they're the only ones in the house. Yeah. And then the other adult can also maybe support the child as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're not feeling like the weights on there. I, I, I know a lot of children who feel like this, this is their responsibility. And I remember working with a lovely young girl who um, heard lots and lots of voices. She had about 50 voices that she heard. I worked with her for a long time and she was, she was about 15 at the time. And she was so stroppy. She was like my stroppy <laughs> like, patient. And she wasn't cool to speak to me and I'm not cool and go away. <laughs> and, and one day I went around and she was just not herself. And so we kind of sat and, and she opened up to me and she said that, I mean, I already knew it, but she told me her, her dad committed suicide and she found him. She got home from school and he was, he was there. Um, and she completely blames herself because she thinks, why didn't I speak to him? Why didn't I help him? Right. And also I wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough for him to stick around. Oh. I think any, anybody who's going through that, any age, anywhere, I just think, Try and stick to facts. So if you're telling yourself these things, you probably believe them, but they're, they're just a story. It's just a story that you're believing. And think about it in, in relation to like a court case. So if you're saying my dad, you know, took his own life because I wasn't good enough, then think about, okay, that's, that's going to go to court and you've got the prosecution and the defense. And what would the prosecution say that I'm not good enough? You know, what are the facts? that I'm not good enough, I wasn't good enough, and write them all down. And then what are the facts that the defense would put together that I was good enough and I am good enough? And then come to something a bit more balanced. And if it can't be positive, like I, I was good enough, my dad just had mental health difficulties and my dad lost hope mm -hmm. and he lost sight. You know, if, if it can't be that positive, then maybe just something a bit more neutral. Like um, I did the best I could. Right, right. Yeah so hard to do writing it down can be really helpful and you can have like a, a, a defense and a prosecution or pros and the cons and, and writing it down but it has to be facts because our feelings are very good at thinking that they're facts but they're not yeah <laughs> facts are not facts <laughs> i think another thing about suicide that i wrote down and the kind of misconception is that people will act sad beforehand. They'll get sad and that necessarily the case at all. And so for you to know that person, some people are very impulsive, impulsive in nature, and they, they can kind of have this thought or get angry. Something happens that makes them feel really angry and they just, just go for it there and then, especially if they've got the, the means to, to do that. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be really sad for weeks or days or months on end um they can be impulsive they use drugs or drink alcohol as well that is always a risk for me that's another little red flag because people are more likely to be impulsive when they're on something but also i've found that when somebody has made the plan and the decision that they're going to take their own life they almost cheer up a little bit because they suddenly have a way out mm. they see like a light yeah. Well, a lot of people will say they're really surprised or I did not see that coming or what the heck, you know, and mm -hmm. so maybe it's because there's not like a true signal at that yeah at that moment. Because it leaves people with this feeling that they should have done something more. And I can feel it when I work with people that take their own life. I feel like gosh, did I missed something really, really hard. 
agree with, but knowing that risk is a probability and you, you, you cannot always get it right. Even as, a, as professionals, you cannot always get it right. So how are you expected to? Yeah, I'm very, very lucky. I haven't watched anybody one-on-one -on -one that has taken their own life, but I've been in a team when somebody has. And I'm, I know I get support for that. I get supervision because it's, it's difficult and there's a lot of questions and a lot of self-blame or blame on others and the family have got blame. And so for, for people as well, I guess, you know, for parents who are struggling and knowing what to do or for children, if you don't have anybody to speak to, there's always professionals, there's people like me. So if you are worried about your son or your daughter or yeah. your, your dad. I like whatever, that looking like, at the facts. You know, I'm, I'm around, just give me a call. Um, and I can't promise I'm gonna make anything better, but having a conversation yeah. helps you think about it because then it's not in your head, this big mess. It's actually, yes. you have to make it make sense to yeah exactly into a sentence yeah that's a really great tool that, and it's not really helpful yeah. you don't have to be alone in, <laughs> in handling and, yeah. and dealing with that yeah yeah but definitely that's another misconception i wanted to to speak about is that people don't get and always sad Yeah, I listened to a few of your podcasts and I was, I heard these questions and I was thinking, well, what are other people listening to? <laughs> what am I reading? Um, I like a variety. So I like books around mental health and think they're great. So a really good one that helped me because I've, I'm, I'm very, very blessed and I've never struggled with depression. So I'm working with patients when they're depressed. I, I, I like to try and get into their space as much as I can because that helps me with empathy. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I read a book by a gentleman called Matt Haig and it's called Reason to Stay Alive. And I don't know if anybody has read it or heard of it, but he went through a period of really bad depression for many, many years on and off and you know, suicide attempts and a lot. And it just gave me an insight into what it's like to be in that dark hole. And I used a lot of some of the images he gave with some of my patients I was working with. And if you think about when you're in that place where you have gone completely against evolution and you feel like you need to take your own life. And if you think about it, our one instinct is to survive. Mm. So if we're, if we're at a point where we think we're better off dead, that hasn't just happened overnight. That's you know, that yeah. is Everybody long, has um, challenges in their to get life. To that point. And, many and when you're people at it, have anxiety you're at the bottom of this, this like kind and of valley so, and it's dark you know, and it's cold and it's lonely and it's scary. Different than and what I say to my person. patients is that's, you know, that's where you so are, you're at the bottom and I'm, you know, these are just top normal and, I'm, and you can't get up on your own challenges and emotions but right now what you're seeing is not reality, it's not real because you're stuck down here and I'm up here and I can see you and I can see everything that the world has to offer and that you to offer um but you just can't right now and that can help give them hope you know i have hope you're going to get better and you're just in this dark space and it's your brain your brain is tricking you into thinking life mm -hmm. can't get better but i'm here where i can see i'm at the top of the valley and i can tell you it's it's good and i'm going to help pull you up and as you get up a bit more a bit more you'll start to get more um objectivity mm. And that was that something I got from him and his book. And it just helps give you some hope because he's got through some very dark times, but it helped me really as, as a parent or somebody who's struggling with a loved one to think about what it's like to be in their shoes because that's the best way to be, to help, I think. Yeah, that's hard to understand if you haven't experienced that before, those feelings. Yeah, I worked for a while in the criminal justice system um, as a psychiatric advisor to the courts and I work with a lot of homeless people they were arrested you know and they have kind of, you know is my decision are they mad or are they bad 
Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's really important. Like, I've never you been mentioned homeless. the Zero so many homeless Suicide people Alliance could begin, and, you know, drugs you know, some and other mental health issues. And, tools. And, and is I've there never anything that you're reading right now or that, would feel like that you I think I struggled in that element to relate to them? So I raised some money for a homeless charity and I slept this? on the streets. Or even just something that you're reading or listening to that's lifting your spirit. To see what it feels like, and it was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it gets cold. Cold. it gets and this was in september first so it wasn't even really cold yeah. and it was just really to put yourself i think you can like we spoke about earlier you can put your own thing on it but it's not about you at that time it's about them so do a little dance and come around and think about that that person and put yourself in their shoes because that's the best way i think to think to how to, how to help them that makes sense yeah and other books i'm trying to think if i've read any others i really like it's not particularly to do with my job. Um, it's a man called Ove. Such a cute book. <laughs> and it's, I'm not, I won't tell you everything, but it's about kind of an old, grumpy, commodious man. Like, <laughs> a guy, like he's, he reminds me of my dad. Like, um, it's so grumpy. <laughs> There's a cat on my garden again. And, um, you know, like, he's been leaving their bike in my alleyway. Just like a really good man. And it's, it just tells you his story and he is so grumpy but so livable and it gives you this new kind of perspective on those grumpy 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 people or men in your life and i read really, it beautiful i love that oh, kind of reminds me of the too. film up yeah. <laughs> yeah. you can just see the oh, other side gosh. they're really human in, in there <laughs> yeah 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 different perspective well, the work that you're doing is incredible. We're so thankful for you. And thank you so much for sharing all of those amazing tips and helping us understand what to look for to make sure that the people that we love are safe. Thank you so much for all the inspiration. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's, it was very inspiring. Yeah. I just talk. Yeah. It's good to talk about everything that people are usually a little afraid to talk about or uncomfortable or timid or <laughs> uncertain. Yeah. 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 It's, it's... Yeah. Yeah. All right. Talk soon. Take care. Have a beautiful day. Yeah. Nice to see you guys. You too. Bye. It can be scary when a friend or loved one is thinking about suicide. If you're in crisis, there are options available to help you cope. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline provides 24-7 free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention, and crisis resources for you and your loved ones. Please call 800-273-8255. And please know that your life is valuable and that you matter. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of Health It's Personal. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts for <laughs> bonus episodes and new releases every Wednesday. The Health It's Personal podcast is produced by me, McKenna Udi, and hosted with the Phronesis Health Initiative team, Karen Jively and Sean Tingle. Special thanks to portrait artist Alexander, musical contributor Bernie Ramke, and to our guests and experts for their kindness and bravery in sharing their stories each week. Please listen, subscribe, sure engage, and send us so topics we can explore that would help you on your journey. Because health, it's personal.